Hi, my name is Jeff Hoffman. Let's talk about the lab techniques that are useful to know for your step one. The polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, is used to amplify DNA. This just means making more DNA from the DNA sample that you already have. To do this, you need your template DNA, a heat-stable DNA polymerase, such as TAC polymerase from the organism Thermus aquaticus, nucleotide primers, which are complementary to the ends of your DNA strand, and the four nucleotide triphosphates, which are the building blocks for your new DNA strands. These are all combined together, and then a machine called a thermal cycler is used to carry them through these three steps. A thermal cycler, as you might guess from its name, cycles between high and low temperatures. The first step is to heat the DNA, which melts it or allows the strands to separate from each other. Next, it cycles back to a lower temperature, which allows the primers to bind to it. The only reason it doesn't bind to another full DNA strand is because the primers are supplied at a much higher concentration. The final step is DNA polymerase making a new strand of DNA, starting from the primer, and using the original strand as a template. This results in two pieces of double-stranded DNA, which is twice as many as you had before. By repeating these steps many times, which is as easy as letting the temperature increase and decrease over and over again, you can end up with many orders of magnitude more copies of DNA than what you started with. For example, 30 cycles would give you 1 billion times more DNA than you started with, since 2 to the 30th power is about a billion. Next, you'll want to make sure you amplify the right thing, which you can do if you know how long the DNA you're trying to amplify is. You can do this by running the PCR products through an agarose gel using electrophoresis, which will separate the fragments by size. By comparing this to a DNA ladder, which contains fragments of known sizes, you can determine whether you amplified the right DNA. Electrophoresis of DNA through a gel is also used in our next lab technique, which is the southern blot. The purpose of a southern blot is to detect specific sequences of DNA, which can help you diagnose genetic disorders, the presence of particular viruses or bacteria, or forensic applications, such as whether a drop of blood came from a certain suspect. First, you have to load your DNA of interest into wells at one end of the gel. Next, you apply an electric current to the gel with a negative charge at the end you put your DNA in and a positive charge at the opposite end. Do you know why you line the charges this way? It's because DNA is negatively charged, so it will run away from the negative end towards the positive end. Since the gel is basically a tightly woven sponge of fibers, larger pieces of DNA take a longer time to get from one end to the other, since they get tangled and slowed down, whereas smaller pieces can get through much more quickly. This principle is what allows you to separate strands of DNA based on size. When you've been using electrophoresis long enough that the smallest strands of DNA are nearing the end of the gel, you remove the charge and transfer the DNA to a filter, where the DNA is more stable and can't diffuse around. At this point, you can use a radio-labeled DNA probe that is complementary to, and therefore targeted to, whatever sequence you're interested in. For example, let's say you suspect your patient has a particular viral infection, and you know that virus is a certain sequence of DNA that is not found in humans. You can create an oligonucleotide that is complementary to that sequence, attach a radioactive label to it so that you can see it later, and then wash it over your filter. If the target sequence you're looking for was not in your original sample, then the labeled probe will wash away, and you won't see anything. But if it was in your sample, then it will stick to its complementary sequence and will show up as a band on an x-ray film. This is the only thing you'll see, since only your probe is radio-labeled, so the rest of the DNA on the filter won't be visible. A northern blot is basically the same thing, except now instead of running DNA through your gel, you're looking at RNA. A western blot also uses a similar concept, except now you're looking at proteins. Since proteins can't be targeted using complementary strands, you instead have to use a labeled antibody, which is specific for your protein of interest. One example of when western blots are used is to confirm the diagnosis of HIV after it's been detected by ELISA, which we'll talk about shortly. Lastly, a southwestern blot is kind of a hybrid between the southern and western blot. The goal here is to detect DNA binding proteins, such as transcription factors. The way you do this is to run proteins through a gel, but then use labeled oligonucleotides as probes. If anything sticks, it's because the DNA bound to that protein, or vice versa. A microarray is a very powerful lab technique since it allows you to perform thousands of genetic tests at the same time. The most common purpose of a microarray is to look at the levels of expression of all genes in the genome. The microarray itself is a small chip about the size of a penny, which has thousands of DNA or RNA probes attached to it. Each probe is usually about 25 base pairs long, and they're arranged in a grid-like pattern on an array. The way you use a microarray is first you take a cell or tissue of interest, dissolve it and isolate the RNA, Label that RNA with a fluorescent tag, which allows you to detect it later, and then wash the RNA across the chip. If a particular gene is expressed at a high level, the RNA from that gene will be more abundant, and more probes in the chip that are complementary to that gene will bind to its corresponding RNA. Next, you let a machine read the chip by looking for those fluorescent labels, and since the probes are arranged in a specific order, the machine knows which ones correspond to which genes. Microarrays are particularly useful when you want to look at large numbers of genes, such as when looking for predisposition to disease or mutations that have given rise to a tumor.
They can also be used to detect single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, which can be used for genotyping or linkage analysis. Our next lab protocol is called ELISA, which stands for Enzyme-Linked Immunosorbent Assay. As its name suggests, ELISA is an immunologic technique which uses specific antibodies or antigens to detect the presence of a target they are interested in. There are two types of ELISA. In the first type, the goal is to find out whether an antibody you're interested in is present in the patient's blood. For example, you might want to look for antibodies to the hepatitis B surface antigen if you think your patient might have hepatitis B. To do this, you start with a surface that has your antigen bound to it. You then add the patient's serum to the surface, let it sit for a few minutes, and then wash it away. If the antibody that corresponds to the antigen is present, it will stick, while everything else will wash off. You can then use a fluorescent or radiolabeled antibody, which targets the FC portion of human antibodies, to let you see whether the antibody was there or not. This will stick to any antibody, but anything that wasn't specific to the antigen you're using will have washed away. So if you see a signal from the secondary antibody, it can only be because it found your target antibody. The second kind of ELISA is basically a reverse version of the first one. In this case, you're looking to see if a certain antigen is present in the person's blood. So now, instead of fixing an antigen to the surface, you fix an antibody instead. And once again, add your serum, and if the antigen you're looking for is present, it'll stick to the antibody. After rinsing this off, you can then add a labeled version of this same antibody to your experiment. And if the target antigen was present in serum, it will allow this new antibody to stick as well. So once again, if you see a signal, that means your target antigen was present. ELISA tests are extremely sensitive, so they're often used to screen for disease such as HIV. Since false positives are not uncommon, these tests can be confirmed by more specific tests, such as a Western blot. Western blots and ELISA both use antibodies to detect a target antigen. But can you think of why a Western blot might be more specific? One reason is that the Western blot allows you to observe the size of what antibodies are sticking to. So if they stick to something that's the wrong size, you'll realize the test is actually negative, whereas with the ELISA, all you know is that it stuck to something. Fluorescence in situ hybridization, or FISH, allows you to directly visualize chromosomal anomalies that are too small to be seen on a karyotype. You start with the chromosomal preparation, and then add DNA probes which are complementary to the sequences you're interested in. Since you can label the probes different colors, you can detect multiple sequences at the same time. In the last step, you'll put your sample under a fluorescence microscope, which can detect specific wavelengths of light. If the sequence you're looking for is present, then you will see the color or wavelength of that light, which corresponds to the oligonucleotide probe. If it's not present, or mutated enough that the probe can't bind to it, then you won't see the light of that wavelength, and you'll know that sequence is not in your sample. Contrary to what you may have seen in movies, cloning is not about making copies of people, but rather it's about making recombinant DNA which is able to self-perpetuate. The first step is to isolate the DNA you're trying to clone. What this means is that you're creating a piece of DNA, usually circular DNA or plasmid, which you can put into a living organism such as a bacterium, and it will replicate as the organism replicates. So this is an example of what you might end up with. This origin of replication is important because if the DNA doesn't replicate, then after a few rounds of division of the cell it's in, most cells won't get any copies of it. This antibiotic resistance gene is important because it allows you to use antibiotics to kill any cells that didn't get your cloned DNA, so you can make sure all the cells have it. And of course, here's the DNA that you cloned. So how do you make this? Well, you can start with a plasma that has everything in it already, except for the DNA you're trying to clone. You can buy these at your neighborhood biotech company. There are specific sequences built in, called restriction sites, which are usually 4, 6, or 8 base pairs long, and the function of these is that they can be recognized and then cut by proteins called restriction enzymes. So first, you'll use these restriction enzymes to cut open your plasmid, and then add your DNA of interest to it, and seal them together using DNA ligase. Then, you can use a process called transformation to get this plasmid into some bacteria, and let them divide a bit. Since your plasmid has an origin of replication, each time the cell divides, your plasmid divides with it. Since only some of the bacteria have received your plasmid, you can take advantage of the antibiotic resistance gene that was built into the plasmid to keep only the ones that you want. To do this, just let the bacteria grow in a plate of auger that has an antibiotic in it, so that any that didn't get your plasmid will be killed. What's the point of this? Well, our purpose is to amplify DNA, just like in polymerase chain reaction, which I talked about earlier. If you clone DNA into bacteria, then let them do what they do best, which is divide, you end up with a lot more copies of DNA than you started with. It can also be useful to make a library of all the genes that were expressed in your sample, which is called a seed DNA library. In this case, you're not cloning a specific sequence, but instead you're reverse transcribing all of the mRNAs that were present, and each bacterium will get one, so your resulting population of bacteria will contain DNA corresponding to all the genes that were expressed. There are a few strategies for manipulating gene expression in animal models. A knockout animal is one in which a particular gene has been removed, and similarly, a knock-in animal is one in which a gene has been added.
One way to knock in a gene is to insert the gene randomly, in which case you don't know where it's going to end up in the genome. In fact, it could end up in the middle of another gene, which would modify its function. A safer method is to target the gene to a specific location, using homologous recombination. To do this, you first have to know where you want to put the gene. Let's say the target region of your genome is represented by these letters, and you want to put the gene right here, between G and C. By flanking your gene on either side with sequences that are complementary to where you want to insert it, it will naturally localize to this exact spot. That's the homologous part. Then, recombination can occur the same way it does during meiosis, and you end up with your new gene exactly where you want it. The Cree lock system is a method that can be used to knock out a gene, and it's controllable so you can knock out the gene at a specific time. This is useful because sometimes you want to see what the effect of removing a gene from an adult would be, even though you know that removing that gene from an embryo would be lethal. To set up the system, you start with two different mice. In one of them, you insert the gene Cree, downstream of an inducible promoter, which you can activate whenever you want, such as by adding a drug. So Cree won't be expressed at all until you add the drug. In the second mouse, you have your gene of interest, with a sequence called a LOX P site on either side of it. When you mate these two mice together, some offspring will receive both the Cree construct and the LOX P construct. When you add your drug and Cree is expressed, it produces an enzyme which causes recombination between LOX P sites. This makes them form a loop, and anything that was between them gets removed. The last method of gene expression modification that I'll cover is called RNAi, or RNA interference. This method targets mRNA rather than the DNA to block gene expression. You can do this by making double-stranded RNA which is complementary to the mRNA you're trying to block, and transfecting this double-stranded RNA into cells. It'll stick to its complementary mRNA, and cells will recognize this as unnatural and possibly dangerous, and will degrade the RNA that's involved so that it won't be translated. The last technique I'll cover is called the karyotype. This is the process of staining, ordering, and numbering chromosomes based on morphology, size, and ratio of arm lengths. This can only be done when DNA is condensed, which is at metaphase, so usually you would use a drug that halts the cell cycle specifically at metaphase first. You end up with an image like this, which allows you to see all the chromosomes so you can look for gross abnormalities and diagnose diseases, such as chromosome imbalances. For example, patients with Down syndrome would have a third 21st chromosome.